Welcome back, friends. Uh, today we're going to take a look at uh, post-Golden Age modern picks. That simply means uh, picks occurring after 1950 that are artist picks. And there's some of my uh, uh, favorite artist picks. In the past, I've showed you some artist picks. And it wouldn't be surprising if most people were not familiar with them because these were with from folks who were popular in the uh, 1910, going uh, far back that far, and even earlier, 20s, 30s, and 40s. But now, uh, many of the picks we're going to see here are actually from an age when at least the baby boomers and, and many of their, thereafter are familiar with uh, the oldest pick going back to about 1950 here. And some of them, a uh, few of the pieces are actually modern. Not all of them are vintage pieces, but they happen to be some of my favorites. Uh, it would actually take a couple hours to go through what's going on with these picks in terms of uh, who, who these folks are, at least the less, uh, less, lesser known ones. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a cursory evaluation and then other stuff you may be interested in. You could take a look at on the Internet because the information is out there. Uh, I selected these uh, this group because there are many others in my collection not shown here that are artist picks that, that I also enjoy. But perhaps uh, there's attributes about these that, that just tickled me at the time and so they happen to be on this particular board. They're not like my top 100 or anything, although many of them could be included in that. Where I want to start with uh, first is the Wrecking Crew out of Los Angeles who gave us so many uh, hits in the 1960s. And the Wrecking Crew can be seen in the upper right. It's a group of picks here that includes uh, Howard Roberts, guitar player Barney Kessel. He was one of the early uh, earliest guitarists for the Wrecking Crew. Carol Kay, bass player. Many folks don't know she's also a jazz player. Then we have uh, Glenn Campbell and Mike Deasy, who was known as the Guitar Man. Now, I put the other Glenn Campbell because uh, these are the three variations I have. But this pick did not occur during his period with the uh, Wrecking Crew. These certainly, these two picks are certainly consistent with that period. So here we have one, two, three, four, five different names from the Wrecking Crew out of Los Angeles. And look at some of these shapes. Yeah, we do have the, the, this common shape here, the 351 and the 346, but also the 352, Barney Kessel and the 358 and a half, and Carol Kay also on the 352. Uh, Howard Roberts' pick also has the heater logo on the uh, uh, other side. Lao D. Heater, a name given to guitars made in Japan that were imported and sold here with a really cool logo, Art Deco logo they have there uh, as well. So we have that group going on, and probably by now Stevie Ray may have jumped out of you in DG Special. DG is Danny Gatton. Now I put these two guys together simply because... Uh, they had a focus in blues, but could play so many other things, and they're so well known to be players that, uh, for for their particular genre, were ahead of their time. And Danny Gatton, certainly uh, a remarkable player. Many of you are familiar with him, and unfortunately, he died of uh, uh, self-inflicted wounds, suicide. But uh, he's on YouTube. You take a look at Danny Gatton, you'll see some. Uh, outrageous guitar playing. Uh, David Grisman, you know, it's not like I'm a big fan of his music or anything, but what's so unique about it is I believe it's actually the first uh, what we call uh, mandolin pick uh, and now even the Grisman shape. Uh, often people associate it with Golden Gate and uh, Golden Gate actually had these produced for uh uh, Grisman in the early 90s. Uh, I know that for certain as a, uh, a luthier who knows David uh, informed me these were made in the 90s. This happens to be one of the rare mo models here. You can find the black, white, and the shell. And here we have two different types of shell. And I believe some of these even have a, uh, a double promo. That is something else on the other side like this. David Grisman also has... Uh, Looks like Rockley on the Rockley Music Center. I don't know who those folks are, but obviously a music store. 
but it's a very unique shape, and I believe David's the first name of a player to show up on that particular shape. Uh, moving over to the left here, we have Harry Volp. Uh, Harry showing up at least in the 1957 catalog, Grossman catalog, and you can see it right here. And it's a heart pick, a heart shape. Now, what's so unique about that is we don't see D'Andrea making the heart during this era. It shows up in the 1920s and early 30s, and we don't see it again. It shows up way later with rock players like Nancy Wilson. But here we have Harry Volp with uh, his name on it, and it has cork on the back. The only cork grip hard pick I know to exist. So those are unique qualities I look for in picks. I'd love to have a George Harrison pick with the Ohm sign on it. That would be a nice pick to have. They're very valuable. Uh, however, something like this interests me even more, even though virtually no one knows who, who Harry Volpe is, but it's because of those new, unique attributes. And it has that type of printing that we see that faded. There was an effort to try to copy gold print at that time that did not work out well. And I'm going to get my flashlight since this lighting is failing to do the job. But uh, so we here we see 1957, an attempt at gold print. Uh, and it really didn't work out that well on that Harry Volt pick. But interestingly, when we take a look at the Les Paul, also from the late 1950s, and this is one of the better examples, that Les Paul print is showing up, uh, but most of the picks bearing Les's name also fade, much like the uh, Harry Volt pick uh, fades. So moving over to the left, more interesting attributes on the guitar pick here. We have John Lodge of the Moody Blues. The only guy I know to have his name on a 360, that's the D'Andrea shape for this. It's considered a very large mandolin pick. And uh, early 70s, undoubtedly, along with Gene Schilling, uh, who was a dulcimer player. Not that they're related at all, they're not. But the fact that Gene Schilling is the only person's name ever to show up on what's known as the 365 shape makes it unique. And here we see it also on a uh, large triangle. Uh, so we have the 365, and uh, that's the 356 right there. Not the largest of DHR angles, but fairly large. And Annie Pearson also has the Gene Schilling pick showing up on a 360, which is a real long mandolin pick, the longest mandolin pick, in fact, more slender than the 360, but a very cool pick. And uh, let me tell you, Annie does a lot of research. She's as thorough as she could be, attempts to contact owners of pick companies and track down players. And I even use her as a reference, and I'd recommend to Annie's website for, for gaining some knowledge on vintage picks. Moving down here to the left, I've done what research I can on Fast Any, and I cannot pin down who that may be. Uh, there was a Fast Any in Motorhead. He didn't come along till 76, though. And I know this pick was produced around uh, 69, because I show it on one of DeAndrea's six-piece promo cards. It has six picks on it, and it includes the ad-libs, which were from that period. So Fast Eddie remaining unknown at the moment. Uh, Red Scooby, however, was a, a vaudeville player, very famous for his time, and uh, Red died in 1973. This pick here, we could easily say 1960s, early 70s. Bobby Hebb had a huge hit uh, with a song called, jazz song called Sonny in uh, 1966 and I really like that pick because of the print it's like a basic print style it's large it's bold and Red Scooby we can see the same thing going on basic print style large bold not quite as bold as the Bobby Hebb but very different from the types of style of print we see on today's rock and roll picks and then we have uh, Giuseppe Patin well-known mandolin player and uh, these, these picks are actually from the 60s and 70s here and could have easily been categorized in some other grouping I had, but I chose this Roman here to show you uh, that there are some unique players on 
or unique shapes with players' names on them. And you could find that pick, actually. That pick's out there. Odie Driscoll produced the Rainbow Pick Card, and you could find me featuring that pick card in the feature I have on large pick displays. And then we have Mr. Spectre, and I would have to tell you this is probably uh, what I consider my most valuable pick on the board, even exceeding that of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie Ray has sold at one time for twelve hundred. They're currently going between four and five fifty right now. Uh, but this Mister Specter here, I, I'm, I'm convinced it's Phil Specter, uh, probably from the mid nineteen sixties, and uh, he was known to be kind of an anal person to work around, and I could see him commanding that people call him Mr. Spectre. So, one of a kind. I've never seen another one before. And then we have Johnny Smith. A uh, Although he's obscure as a player, he is one of the finest jazz guitarists there was. Uh, also a session player. And I could have included him over here with some session players. But I wanted to feature these three together because this is 1930s and these two from 1960s. Both in the same shape both in the same print style. And I cannot tell you who made that a particular pick. It is a DeAndre shape 352 and a half, but I'm prone to believe that some other maker may have copied that shape. Now, uh, beneath it, we have uh, Gene Lees, who was a popular LA instructor, and you can look him up online, even helping out the Beach Boys, I believe. Hank Garland, an incredible a uh, country player that could play everything, including jazz. We have uh, Chad Adkins moving uh, o over here, along with Les Paul. And these two were featured, actually, in the Gibson Master Pack of the 1990s. Now, this is said to be one of Les Paul's personal picks. Uh, I don't know the, the history on this, but I can tell you the Prince style is 1970s, uh, early 80s. And then we have two of the original Les Pauls that were put out first in the 1950s, but continued to sell throughout the 60s, and I believe even into the early 70s. Uh, moving along here, uh, some rock players. As you can see, I do not have too many rock players on here. We have EC, Eric Clapton, in Japan and Korea. Those aren't quite vintage, as it tells us the year is 97. The so Guess Who got that from the folks at uh, Harris Musical Products. Uh, years ago in the 1990s uh, via another collector, Richie Blackmore, genuine tourist, but I don't believe that's uh, a vintage pick at all, and it was made in Japan. Moving down over here to the left, we have the blues players, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, that's not vintage. Obviously, Mo Keb is not vintage. John Mayo, not vintage. Lonnie Brooks, yes, that's vintage. How do we know that? By the Prince style that was uh, chosen right there. Uh, over to here, we have Steve Lukather of Toto, but you know, he played a lot with Ringo too, and it happens to be one of my favorite picks. We show Ringo 2013, and that was a great concert out there in L.A. at the Greek Theater, and I was so happy to be part of that concert, so I picked that pick up for personal and sentimental reasons, as many people do get artist picks just for that reason. Right here, we're moving into all our jazz players down here. Uh, Pat Malone, Al Demiel with gold and white print, Tony Rizzo. This happens to be Phil Up Church. I only know two of those floating out there. And the one I gave to a collector on the East Coast, I don't even know if he still has it, Jimmy Bruno. If you're a jazz person, you know these names quite well. Of course, George Benson did uh, did well with some pop stuff, too. John Schofield. Now, these are not vintage Pixies, too, here, but were actually Japanese promos. Yet they're uh, not too easy to come across here in the U.S. You can by way of Japan, Pat Matheny, Lee Rittenauer. And if you look at that, Lee Rittenauer bears a striking resemblance in print style to the Mr. Spectre and uh, Johnny Smith and Driscoll. So that's probably one of Lee's earliest picks. Here's two others. This is the D'Andrea 354, and this is the Japanese copy. As you can see, the Japanese copy is slightly larger than the D'Andrea made one. Uh, looking at uh, 1970s here, and this is from a late, later period, I would believe, uh, coming out of Japan, 
1980s perhaps. And at the bottom here, we have Bart Whedon, a session player. Uh, he had a hit in the UK in the late 1950s. And it's the first uh, home plate pick, I believe, that actually showed an artist's name on it. I have no idea what JTC means. Maybe some of you out there do, and you could shoot me a note on it. It's always good to learn more about picks. So I'm really pushing it on time. This is one of the longer videos. Uh, but those are a few of my favorites, and now you know why. I'm looking at for interesting colors, interesting shape, and interesting print styles just as much or more than I am the name on the pick. Well, let's not forget we kind of glossed over Bob Dylan. That's a genuine vintage pick. Uh, 1992, just turned vintage recently. It ain't me, babe, Bob Dylan. So uh, I'm going to sign out for now, and I'll be back with some more artist picks in the future. However, the next few videos, we're going to go back to solid vintage stuff. And talk to you soon. Feel free to leave a comment. Joe Macy, find pick seven at Yahoo. Or leave a comment right here. Thank you. Bye-bye.